Hello, I'm John Rickard, pastor at Our Redeemer Lutheran Church in Newark, Delaware. The message you are about to hear was delivered December 31st, 2017, in a watch night service. This date, of course, is New Year's Eve in our country and the circumcision and name of our Lord Eve. The sermon is titled Marking Time, and the text is Luke 12, 38. The other lections for this evening or lections for this evening are Isaiah 30, verses 8 through 17, Romans 8, verses 31b through 39 and Luke 12, 35 through 40. Our intro it is from Psalm 98, the first three verses, and the antiphon was Psalm 124, verse 8. May God add your bless his blessing to the hearing of his word. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is Luke 12, 38. If the master comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. Here ends the reading of our text. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. Amen. Please be seated. And Happy New Year! Of course, tonight is New Year's Eve for only a rather small slice of the world. This year, the Chinese New Year will fall on January 25th. The Muslims are not going to celebrate New Year until August 19th. And just in case you didn't know it, we already missed New Year. If you were a Hindu, because that was on November 14th. I might also point out that our tradition of celebrating New Year's on January 1st really isn't all that old, less than five centuries. It became popular in the, in the West, well, after the Gregorian uh, calendar came out. So if you could get in your Wayback Machine, how many people remember Wayback Machines? Okay, if you could get in your Wayback Machine and go back to, oh, say, 732, when Charles, Charles Martel, I'm having trouble tonight, and the Franks stopped the Franks, uh, stopped the Muslims from coming across France and conquering Europe, and you greeted everybody on January 1st with Happy New Year's, they would be scratching their head and wondering what in the world you were talking about. For them, it was the circumcision and name of Jesus, which, by the way, is tomorrow also. And we still recognize that. And which is why it's okay for us to have the Lord's Supper on a secular holiday. Because it is circumcision in name of Jesus festival. But anyways, uh, coming back to that, throughout medieval Christian Europe, the new year was celebrated on many days. Of course, a popular one was Christmas Day. But they also did it on March 1st. March 25th, which happens to be the Feast of the Annunciation, and of Easter. As I said, only with the Gregorian calendar reforms, which came out in 1582, did January slowly gain prominence in the Christian West as the beginning of a new year. As you might guess, many areas resisted the new calendar and the designation of January 1st as the beginning of a new year, simply because Gregory was, after all, a Roman Catholic bishop, and there were a lot of people that that was reason enough to reject January 1st. So, for example, Russia only accepted the Gregorian calendar after the 1918 revolution when the communists took over. That's when they adopted the Gregorian calendar. And they weren't the last. Greece did it in 1923. And currently, there are many Orthodox churches that still follow the Julian calendar, which lags 13 days behind the Gregorian calendar. That's right. 13 days from now, there will be many Orthodox uh, Christians 
that are celebrating January 1st. Marking time, though, is something that is natural. It seems to kind of be hardwired into us. We even find it in the Genesis account of creation where we read God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heaven to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Marking time. The first actual written record that we have of people celebrating a new year is from Mesopotamia, and it was around 2000 B.C. The celebration was in mid-March. Dividing the day into hours is also ancient, and you might find this interesting. First ever mention of a half hour, dividing hours up further. You know, yeah, half hour, the book of Revelation, first written record. Farming, farming, commerce, military activity are all improved by marking time. By marking the seasons, that is time, a farmer knows when to plant and when to harvest. By marking time, a business knows when to open its doors and when to close and when to hurry if they want to get the deposits in at the bank. By marking time, a military can coordinate its attack or know when to change the centuries. It is hard to imagine a modern society getting along without an agreed-upon way to mark time. In our gospel lesson, Jesus tells a parable where the servants are urged to keep watch, waiting for the master of the house to return. The very idea carries with it the concept of passing time. In the parable, the return of the master is referring to the return of Christ at the end of time. I know I'm not telling anybody here anything new. The idea of different watches includes the idea of passing time, right? You know, first watch, second watch. The idea of the servants who are Christians not knowing when the master is going to return guides us to the truth that nobody really knows when Jesus will return at the end of time. The parable, therefore, urges us to always be ready for our Lord's return. As the days after the ascension of our Lord stretched first days, then weeks, then months, then years, then decades, and so on, it became clear to the Christians that Jesus was not going to return in the first watch. Therefore, our liturgical calendar began to develop and take shape. By marking days like Christmas and Epiphany, Christians were able to frame their lives in terms of the life of Christ. This expanded to include significant events like Pentecost and significant Christians like Peter and Paul. To be quite honest, today there are more, way more, way, way more worthwhile events and peoples to remember than we have days in a year. We could have different saints on each day of the year for a decade. Just, you know, and, and still not run out of good people. I find looking at the liturgical calendars used by other Christians instructive and spiritually helpful. They often teach me about things that I would have otherwise overlooked. But the main function of any good liturgical calendar is not simply to provide us with historical and interesting histor history tidbits, but to help us focus our hearts and minds on Jesus. So, when those who use the Book of Common Prayer on October 29th remember James Hannington and his companions who were martyred in Uganda in 1885, we focus first on the Christ whom they proclaimed. Their deaths can remind us of the death of Jesus. After all, they died so that the Ugandan people might hear about our Savior 
and receive the salvation of their soul, that they might be set free from the darkness of sin. And isn't that exactly why Jesus died? Such a commemoration might also lead us to ask ourselves just what we are willing to sacrifice for the Lord's work. If it came down to a choice between life and death, would we choose eternal life over temporal life? Would we choose heavenly riches over temporal riches? Would we choose a seat at the heavenly banquet over a seat at the table of the rich and famous here on earth? Such saints can help us ask such difficult personal questions. When false preachers come promising us health, wealth, and worldly acclaim, a review of a good liturgical calendar can help us see through the lies, for we notice how many great saints of old lacked those things. When someone says it doesn't matter what we believe, a review of a good liturgical calendar can help us see through the lie as we notice how many great saints were martyred exactly because they knew what you believe matters. How we mark time really does make a difference. A good liturgical calendar helps us to celebrate the birth of Jesus instead of an improved bottom line. Not that anything is automatically wrong with an improved bottom line. But if money becomes our focus instead of our Lord Jesus, then we have slipped into idolatry. The same is true for presents, decorations, dinners, and the like. Nothing wrong with them in and of themselves. But they are deadly if they take our eyes off of Jesus. The watch night service was originally designed to aid us in asking such personal questions. A person reviews their past year and asks if it has been a year of keeping watch or a year of falling asleep at our post or turning our attention away from our assigned job and letting unimportant things keep us from watching for our Lord. Of course, the bitter answer to such questions is that all too often we have fallen asleep at our post. That is because we still have our old Adam. But the sweet truth is that our returning master is always ready to forgive the repentant servant and renew their position as sentries of the Lord. We get stationed again to keep watch. So our main focus is to be on the Lord, even in a watch night service when we might think that the focus is on ourselves. He is the one for whom we keep watch, who our hearts long to see. For those who have been brought to faith in him, his appearing will be as an expert advocate and not a stern prosecutor. He pleads our case and wins. He wins not because of our merits, but because of his own merit. Our good works are keeping watch is not presented as something that justifies us, but as evidence that we have received the justification He granted to us by grace through faith in Him. However, Jesus says, if the Master finds the servants awake, blessed are those servants. The clear message is that Jesus is pleased to find His servants ready for Him, carrying out their duties as servants in His kingdom. The blessing Jesus is referring to is not entrance into the kingdom, for that is not dependent on our works. One cannot, in fact, be a servant of the kingdom, as these centuries clearly are, if they are not already part of the kingdom. You don't put the enemy in charge of your gate. There are loyal troops that are in charge of your gate, right? This blessing is a reminder that heaven is a land of blessing and how we live does impact what we receive in glory. You can rest assured that that person who receives Christ on their deathbed 
does indeed enter heaven, but the rewards they receive will not shine anywhere near as brightly as the rewards received by the Virgin Mary and her husband Joseph. Yet those more brilliant rewards are also gifts of God's grace. For no sinner actually deserves any heavenly reward. Still the Lord of all mercies grants them. So tonight, as we mark the end of 2019 and look forward to 2020, let us not only take stock of how we have lived before the Lord this past year, let us not only consider how we can put our faith into action in this coming year, but let us especially remember our Lord Jesus. He is the one who grants us the gift of living in His kingdom. He is the one who grants us a place among the saints when He returns. He is the one who is pleased when we mark our time, mark our days, by the evidence of His grace and mercy in time. He is the one who is returning. May our gracious Lord mark each of your days and hours this coming year with evidence of His timely, timeless mercy. Amen. May the peace of God which passes human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.